I'm Tim Ventura, and we're joined today by Sophie Wilson, who jointly designed the ARM processor along with Steve Ferber. There are currently over 200 billion ARM-powered chips in existence, with around 7 billion shipping every quarter, equating to 900 chips per second and 70 million chips per day. Sophie's pioneering work is in nearly every smartphone, tablet, and smartwatch on the planet, and that work continues today as a fellow and distinguished engineer at Broadcom. Maximum PC called her one of the 15 most important women in tech history, and she has been honored as a commander of the Order of the British Empire, a fellow of the Royal Society, an honorary fellow at Selwyn College, and a distinguished fellow of the British Computer Society, among many other awards and honors. She joins us today to discuss the past, present, and future of the ARM processor. So Sophie, welcome. Let me begin by thanking you for the tremendous honor of being able to interview you. And let me ask, what does it feel like to have the the work that yourself and Steve did evolve into such a tremendous success? It feels quite strange. Um, we did our work back in the early 80s. Um, Steve left Acorn. Arm originally stands for Acorn Risk Machine. So that was the, the founding company where all the work was done. So Steve had left Acorn by about 1987 to go off and become a professor at Manchester University. Um, where he worked on artificial intelligence, basically. Um, and I remained with ACORN when ARM itself was founded in 1990. Um, so we worked together for what, looks, looking back, seems quite a brief time. And we were consultants to ARM when it had founded. And I think by about 2008, when ARM had shipped 1 billion processor cores, not chips at that time, um, they could still count the number of cores, um, we began to think it would be a tremendous success. Um, and after that, it was just a matter of arithmetic to reach 200 billion chips. And now nobody's counting how many processor cores there are. So yeah. uh, it's an overnight success that took 40 years. Yeah, yeah. Well, so before ARM, there was Proton, which you built back in 1981 in less than a week to help your firm win a BBC educational computing contract. So I understand that's kind of the that that's that's kind of where where you uh, got into it, I guess. And then ARM came later in 1983. Originally, is a 32-bit architecture with 26-bit memory space, and it's evolved since then into a true 64-bit system. Can you tell me about some of the initial design challenges and considerations that you had with this system? So it's important to understand the era. So 1979, 1977, etc. Microprocessors had only just arrived, and there were sensationalist programs on TV about them, like the the chips are down, microprocessors will change the world's life. Um, but nobody knew much about them. Um, so some people, Herman Hauser, who founded Acorn, got very interested in the idea that these things would take over. So he went to start up a, a, a business, a consultancy, which he called Cambridge Processing Unit, um, to, to, to advise him really on microprocessors and help him work out what they were about and he would make money by consulting to other firms so the people he gathered around him myself Steve Ferber Chris Turner we worked and made prototype little computers and they were little computers the, the there were 8-bit processors 6502 National Semiconductors SCMP um, in use um, and they allowed us to make quite complicated computers so Acorn had a whole range of computers the system range which were cards in racks that you could build up very powerful systems and the consultancy business put microprocessors into fruit machines and poker tables and all sorts of things um, and we started casting around for what would happen next. Um, 
And there, there was a lot of discussion in the company at the time. Um, Motorola, Intel, National Semiconductor were all launching the first 16-bit processors. So the Motorola 68000, Intel 8088, 8086, 8080, and so on. Um, and National Semiconductor's 16032, as it was when it was originally launched. Later on, they turned the digits around and made it 32016. Um, and they were claiming that these machines would be enormously powerful compared with the 8-bit machines that we had. Um, so we had a big argument about what the next machine would be for the company. Um, and it took us a long time to resolve that. So Professor Andy Hopper wanted us to make scientific computers. So he favored things like 32016 or 68,000 based things. Herman wanted to build computers for office automation. Um, so he favored the 8086, 8286 um, sort of processor for office work. Um, Chris Curry wanted to make another home computer such as the Acorn Atom. And nobody knew, you know, we all knew we could only do one of these things, um, which was it to be. And eventually I came up with the tiebreaker, which was to say, okay, we'll build a multiprocessor computer and the IO processor part of it can be deployed by itself as a home computer. And then you can add a language processor to it. And the language processor could either be a more powerful home computer, or it could be an office automation computer, or it could be a scientific computer. And everybody said, oh, okay, that's what we'll do. And at a stroke, months of ringing was, was uh, over with. Meanwhile, Chris Curry, a, a director of Acorn, had found that the BBC wanted to make a, a, an in-depth TV series about computers. And that in-depth series um, was going to be a problem because at the time, all computers were different. So they'd already worked out that they needed to have something specific to their purposes, that it had to perform well in the studio, as well as at people's homes, it had to run a standardized version of basic and all that sort of thing. And they'd spent a year working with other companies to try and make a prototype of that machine. So Chris had got wind of this, which was essentially not a big secret, but a secret that um, was foreign to us in Acorn and had said to them, oh, you ought to come and see the prototype of our next computer, the Proton, um, which of course didn't exist. We'd only got to the stage of resolving the arguments. Um, uh, so Herman rang Steve and myself on Sunday evening with the BBC due to come on Friday. And the conversation went roughly, um, hello, Steve, um, it's Herman here. We'd like to get a prototype of Proton built over the next week. And Steve said, that's impossible. Herman rang me, said much the same thing. Um, and I said, no, that's impossible. Okay. We don't even have a circuit diagram. And then Herman was very cunning and he told each of us that the other had already consented and thought it was possible. Ah, okay, okay. So we turned up for work, very skeptical, but if you know, I was, if Steve thinks it's possible, um, perhaps it's possible and he knows something I don't know. So we rapidly found out that neither of us had agreed, um, but we decided to give it a go anyway. And so we started on the Monday, drawing up the schematics of the BBC Micro, the Proton prototype. Um, and uh, you know, with Chris Turner, Acorn's chief engineer, building the list of parts that we would need, many of which were unique. Um, we had particular ideas about how processors shared memory with graphics and video. And that meant we'd have to have faster DRAMs than existed at the time. And I'd found in a Hitachi data book that they were going to make a 16K by four RAM that would be fast enough. So Herman managed to talk the Hitachi rep to hand carry in some of them into the country by Wednesday. The only prototypes of such a thing 
we'd need a 6502 that ran twice as fast as normal, et cetera, et cetera. There were a whole load of stuff. So by Wednesday, we'd got a circuit diagram and most of the parts, not quite all of them, but most of them. And now we merely had to make it. Now, normally you make a computer with a printed circuit board that's been designed and, and built and so on. We couldn't do that. So we had to build it with a prototyping system. So Acorn was used to VeroWire as a prototyping system, but there are tens of thousands of connections, even in the Proton prototype, let alone the final BBC Micro. Yeah. These, these things had hundreds of chips in them. Each chip has 14 to 40 legs and they're all interconnected. So there are tens of thousands of interconnections to make it work. So we used a professional prototyping system called WireWrap and imported from Cambridge Computer Lab the fastest wire wrap gun in the West, Ramanush Banerjee. And so they built it over Wednesday into Thursday. And uh, you know, with tens of thousands of connections, it didn't work. Nobody was surprised. We had planned for that. So um, we attached it to an in-circuit emulator coming out of an Acorn system range machine and uh, use the Acorn system range machine, you know, the, the plug going into where the processor should be to exercise all its functions and found all the wire wrap errors and corrected them. So by about 2 a.m. Friday morning, we had all the wiring faults found and fixed and it didn't work. And at that stage, I said, well, um, it doesn't work, but if it does work, it will need some programs port into it and generally setting up and making work. And uh, if that will be me, won't it? Because I was the programmer. Um, I shall go home because I can't program in this state. Um, we'd worked some very long days and uh, very long nights. So I, I went home and I came back at eight o'clock in the morning after a very useful four plus hours sleep to find everybody else, Steve, Herman, Chris, under the benches, um, asleep on the floor, and the machine was working. Uh -huh. Okay, okay. So um, Herman claims credit for this because he said, well, if the machine seems to work um, when seen through the logic analyzer, but doesn't work, then it must be the logic analyzer, the, the in-circuit emulator that's at fault. So take that out, put a proper processor in it and it will work fine. And they did, and it did. Yeah, so, and I under, I understand you had so then you had last minute debugging that went into this and and again this so this device was this this was kind of the where you guys really cut your teeth right and and and, and then well you, we cut out, I mean we've been building computers for a long time so well a long time in startup years anyway so um, so I rapidly ported an operating system to it, ported a co current copy of Acorn Basic, um, configured the graphics controller and had a high resolution screen with a little random dot walking around it by the time the BBC arrived. Now the BBC weren't idiots. They understood that Chris was blagging them and that there wasn't a prototype. So they were, their socks were properly blown off to see a working prototype that was more than other companies had been able to achieve in comparable time or indeed much longer. So we got awarded that the contract to build the BBC microcomputer and that bit of the rest is history. But what's important about that machine is it was a dual processor machine. So not only did we do all the stuff about building the BBC microcomputer and fulfilling all our obligations, and so I think we sold about one and a quarter million of them um which was quite a lot for the time um though it doesn't seem a very big number when compared with a couple of hundred billion um but we could experiment with second processors we you, you could now implement an entire computer just by building a processor and its memory and attaching it to a bbc micro which did everything else you know it had the io processor the network the video, the keyboard, everything was there. So it was very easy to build processors um, and compare them. And so we built our own prototypes for the National Semiconductor 32016. Um, we built prototypes of a high-speed 6502. What happens when you double the clock speed of a 6502 again? 
um, and so on. And what we found was out of all these processes, whatever claim they'd made, if you equalized it for the instruction fetch memory bandwidth, they all performed the same. So a four meg 6502 fetched four million instructions per second, an eight megahertz 68,000 only fetched two million instructions per second. Um, and they performed very similarly when you, you know, that 6502 was one byte instructions, the 68,000 was two byte instructions and they, they performed identically um, overall. Um, and you'll remember I said things about, we had particular views on how high performance memory systems should work. Well, we could build memory systems vastly more performant than any of the 8286, 68,000, 32016, et cetera, could use. We could build memory systems that were four or five times the bandwidth. There wasn't a processor. We went around everybody trying to find a processor that could use such high amounts of memory bandwidth. Um, so you know, we visited the big companies in their offices around the world, um, National Semiconductor in Israel, the rest in America, and saw what you'd expect to see, you know, big buildings full of lots of people making stuff. But we had an allegiance to the 6502, so we also visited Western Design Center, home of the 6502. Um, and that was a bit of a surprise because Western Design Center was a couple of bungalows on the outside of Phoenix run by some electronic engineers and a, a bunch of essentially school kids, um, not yet graduates at, at college. And they were designing processes just by sitting there thinking about it and sticking tape on Rubylith. And the 65 SC816, which is what they were designing at the time, um, we thought that wasn't a brilliant design, but if they could design it, the big lesson for us was maybe we could design something. So Professor Andy Hopper had stuck risk pre-pressed data on my desk at work. So we had the initial papers from Stanford, Berkeley and IBM saying there's this new simpler way. And the, the three machines are vastly different in, in design, but one thing was very clear, they could be designed by small teams. And in the case of the Berkeley RISC one and the Stanford MIPS one, they could be designed by small teams of graduate level people. So another example of eh, maybe we can design one of these things. And, and it turned out we could. Um, yeah. Yeah, well, and actually, that was what I was going to ask about the risk architecture, because, uh, you know, it, so at, at that time, Berkeley risk was in full swing, it was funded by DARPA, and and then it had this goal of streamlining these instruction sets. So it, it, it sounds like the, the small team aspect of it was really one of the one of the benefits there. Um, was that the primary consideration or was there also, again, at the time, I imagine this was kind of one of those hot technologies. So I, I wondered if that kind of factored into why you chose risk. Um, well, we, we really took the lesson of if you simplify the design of the instruction set and the design of the internals of the machine enough, then it becomes a, a KISS project, keep it simple, stupid, um, and then you could do things. So we designed quite complicated digital logic, the bits and pieces inside a BBC microcomputer. The, 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 there are several things that are 20 or 30 logic packages big that needed to be compressed into what, what was then called a, a ULA, a, um, a custom integrated circuit. Um, and so we, we got familiar with complex logic and the, the, the risk principles made designs of microprocessors much less complicated to the extent where we could grasp how to do them. So we would have discussions. I propose instructions and Steve would work out if he could do them. And if he couldn't, then we'd discuss how to vary the instruction design so that they could be done. So sometimes I, I could get my way big time. So 
the, you know, the first arm um, has a load multiple instruction and a store multiple instruction. And they're quite complicated instructions that risk processors usually don't have, but Steve could see how to do them and we could both see the value of them. So they were in, but other things like add, compare and branch, which would be extremely useful in, a, a, in things like the x86 instruction set, um, th that, well, it's not decrement and branch, isn't it? Um, that sort of instruction, he couldn't see how to change his hardware to make one of those things happen effectively. So I couldn't have such an instruction. And we went on like that for quite a long time. Um, and, well, then it all worked out well. Um, building stuff is tricky. And Acorn was in a fairly unique situation because it had bootstrapped itself from scratch. You know, it, it built its first things with microprocessors um, brought in, but it had no development tools of it uh, um, that you could buy off the shelf. So we built all our own development tools, all our software developments, assemblers, and so on. We built the lot ourselves. Um, and so building ARM and building a new set of development tools, that was fine. We were used to that sort of thing. Ah, okay. What? Well, so I also wanted to touch on the power efficiency because th this is something I, ARM processors are notable for this, right? That's why, I mean, that's one of the reasons that they dominate mobile equipment. So was that something, especially having this combination of power and efficiency course, have those elements uh, it, it, have they been part of the design from the beginning, or is that something that kind of evolved into it over time? So power efficiency is something that was a goal of the implementation of the ISA, but not of the ISA. So the goal of the ISA was to build something that we thought was powerful, that would be easy to program for human beings and easy to write compilers for. And we were pretty Catholic in what we considered a compiler. ARM was built from day one to execute other languages than C. You get a different answer to how to design an instruction set if you just say it's only going to execute C or it's only going to execute Fortran or it's only going to execute Lisp or Simular or Prolog or whatever. Um, ARM was designed to execute a lot of them, um, which, which, which did make it quite different for many. Um, so that's what the ISIS goal was, make something powerful and, and easy to, to use for um, both humans writing in assembly language and also useful for people writing compilers for arbitrary languages. Um, so Steve uh, had a different problem. He had to get the whole machine into a cheap package. So the ARM project as a whole we weren't just building an ARM processor, we built a memory controller, a video controller, and an IO controller as well. And the four chip set was designed to make more Acorn computers. And we didn't like paying lots of money for our chips. We didn't like putting extensive noisy cooling systems in our computers. We didn't like putting massive expensive power supplies in our computers. So we always tried to design our computers down to the cheapest that uh, was sensible. So Steve knew the arm would have to go into a plastic package. So when he was designing it, he made sure that every decision he took um, was directed at making the power low because he had to get into a plastic package. Now, uh -huh. he didn't have any development tools to tell him what the effective power would be. At the time, we had SPICE simulators and that was it. We had Apollo domain design tools with VLSI technology um, chip making set on it, but they didn't have any good power estimation techniques, at least ways none that we believed. They, they gave silly answers. Um, Steve built a register transfer level model of the processor in BBC Basic running on BBC Micros. And that's that's the foundation model of what is what is an arm. And we also built other systems to verify against that. Okay. Um, and at all at all stages of Steve designing 
how the microarchitecture would work, he was trying to be careful about where the power went. So when the first chips came back, 26th of April, 1985, um, they were popped into the board. The board didn't work, of course. Yeah. Big lesson, nothing works unless you've tested it in advance. Um, so Steve had to troubleshoot the board and find out what was wrong, correct that, and then the chips worked and we opened a bottle of champagne. And then obviously Steve had worried about the power these chips took. So there were test points on the board to measure the current that was going into the processor. So he took the jumper off, connected the multimeter across to measure the current, and there was no current. Um, the processor was running perfectly happily, but not taking any power at all. Now this was because there was another mistake on the board and power wasn't wired to the processor correctly. Um, so the processor was running entirely off the energy on its IO signals, ad address bus and data bus connected to the other chips on the board. Mm. That's all the power it was taking through the protection diodes of those ports. Um, and later on, Steve did measure the power and it was about a factor 10x less than he'd estimated it might be. And of course, the power he'd estimated it might be had to be low enough to fit into a five watt plastic package. Oh, so we I had see. a half watt processor instead of a five watt processor. Yeah, and that's that's remarkable. Would it be fair to say that today's ARM devices then are the beneficiaries of these evolutionary pressures to meet such a wide range of computing needs? You'd mentioned running, being able to process multiple languages and, you know, as well as some of the efficiency requirements, right? Like, uh, you know, not wanting to have expensive chips, expensive fans, having it fit in like a five watt case, you know. Um, do, do you think these are contributing factors that led to today what is such a flexible, and robust and efficient device? Um, probably. Um... What, what led to today overall was the leadership shown by Robin Saxby when he set up ARM's business model. So, yeah, again, it's easy to forget, but back in 1990, there were no companies like ARM. Um, so, yeah. so ARM was growing quite happily inside Acorn. And as we got more successful, it became a problem for other companies. We were approached by people like Apple saying, we'd like to use ARM, but as long as it's 100% controlled by Acorn, we don't trust you and um, it, it, we cannot go on. So from about 1987 onwards, as well as doing the technical develop and continuing with things like the first system on a chip in the world, which was essentially the ARM and its memory controller, video controller and IO controller all pushed onto one chip, all at once and then later on we built more system on chips not knowing how important system on chip would become to the world we just blithely went ahead and did them um, so as other companies came along and said we're not happy with this idea so you, know, you have to do all this technical stuff but you also had to redesign how the company worked and eventually that meant spinning out the company into a jointly owned thing 40% of it owned by Acorn, 40% owned by Apple, 20% owned by VLSI Technology. And uh, well, no, those numbers are wrong, aren't they? Of, of the section that isn't owned by the staff. Um, so, so the staff got to be equity. But Robin Saxby came up with the model that the, the ARM company um, would not sell chips, it would not sell final things, which would have been the model at the time, it would sell intellectual property to other companies, allowing to them to build chips based on ARM's designs. Y yeah, well, and that's an important, that's an important note. I actually, I found this while I was doing research. So Apple was involved with this from, from close to the beginning. So if it's okay, I'd like to jump to, I actually have an Apple uh, related question here, because there there are currently over 900 million 
active iPhones in the world. Um, it, and, you know, there are only 100 million active Macs. This one's a little more speculative because a, a while back, I predicted this, this wasn't a difficult prediction to make, that Apple would fully transition to an ARM architecture I mean, it, just because there's, there's cost savings, application portability, you know, it eliminates the complexity of separate code bases. Um, I, I'm wondering, what are your thoughts on seeing Apple actually take the plunge and make this transition a reality? I think everybody's been aware, particularly since the Gerard T. Williams III designs, um, that they were building extremely powerful cores well beyond even high-end tablet. And so, um, what, around A12 or something like that, it became fairly obvious that you could make a pretty convincing ultralight laptop with the A12, and if they continued executing, um, which they did, um, then you would be in a situation, A15, M1, that you had massive amounts of processor power. Um, and of course, like the company they are, they changed the rules of the game as well. Um, bringing not only the same core but the same soc methodology so in in phones um systems on chip mutated unexpectedly so for, for a while in phones back in the nokia days you built a, a, a large soc and put as much of your stuff as you could but then you had conventional dram sitting on the printer circuit board and you probably have had a conventional radio as well. And you could see that at some stage, the SOC would eat the radio, but eating the DRAMs. So package on package technology in phones, if you wanted your phones to get thinner, you had to eat the DRAMs because there wasn't enough space in the phone envelope otherwise, mm, especially okay. if you wanted the battery to, to last a long time. So you use package on package technology to put the DRAM packages on top of the SOC. And Apple have brought that technology into the laptops and tablets. And that's what makes a huge difference because they've essentially eliminated the external bus that connects the processor to the DRAMs. It's now an internal bus and it's under their control and they can by putting down more DRAMs in parallel, they can boost the memory bandwidth. And if you remember way back, I said memory bandwidth is a prime determinant of performance. So with 400 megabyte per second memory bandwidths on their SOCs, um, what did I mean gigabytes? I think I probably did mean gigabytes. Oh dear, there are times when uh, being in this business for a long time, you do slip a, a thing. The first hard drive I ever saw in an Acorn machine was five megabytes. And you'd think, why do you need a hard disk drive to have five megabytes in it? Um, surely you mean gigabytes, but no, I mean megabytes. <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm I'm in my 40s, and and uh, when I was in school, I, I if I remember right, at the time the state of the art was uh, in fact they were Apple products then. It was I think 20 megabyte hard drive, you know, and they, and they were incredibly excited to have that in the in the school lab. So, yes, I, I mean all the development of Basic for ARM was done on a machine with 800 kilobyte floppy disks as its storage method. And we were quite excited to get five megabyte hard drives because that meant we could put the whole of the source of the operating system and basic and several of the applications all on the same machine, build the whole lot. Yeah. Well, anyway. if it's okay to fast forward to, so to fast forward back to the present with, in terms of ARM chips, these power many perhaps most of the 240 million 911 calls, that's in the US alone. 
They provide 2 billion people with internet access in emerging nations who otherwise wouldn't have it, power millions of biomedical devices. And according to the University of Oxford, they're actually empowering women's rights across the globe. So I, I'm wondering, what are your thoughts on the human aspect of how ARM chips are helping people? Um, technology would have happened anyway. Um, this is this is my standard belief. Uh, technology came out of everywhere around the world, and you know each part is now interdependent on the other. We couldn't design better lithography machines without better processors to do the simulations, etc. We couldn't design better cameras and lenses without better computers. We can't design better computers without better lithography machines and lenses and cameras and, and so on. It all feeds back on itself. Um, if there wasn't ARM technology, I think the world would be a very similar place, um, just with some other label on the processor. Ah, uh, that's incredible humility, incredible humility. Um, <laughs> Sophie, let, let me let me close by saying thank you again for your time. It is a tremendous honor. You are incredibly charming. It is so wonderful to, to be able to interview you. Um, let me ask, what comes next for you personally? What should be what should we be looking for in headlines in the days to come? Oh, I'm going to knock off soon and have dinner. Um, um, so. I haven't worked directly for ARM um, for quite a while. Um, in, in the late 90s, well, no, in the early 90s, I started designing another processor. Um, and essentially that led to the next startup um, uh, exploiting that processor. And I'm still doing that. Um, and I've been doing that for the last, ooh, 24 years or so, which I think is now longer than uh, I've worked on ARM chips. Mm. <laughs> so Firepath fire is where my cycles go. Ah, okay. Well, thank you. Thank you yet again.